Hi, my name is Ted Cross, and I'm a technical advisor with Novi Labs. Today I'll be presenting our paper, Use of Machine Learning Production Driver Cross-Sections for Regional Geologic Insights in the Bakken Three Forks Play. Thanks to my co-authors, Kieran Sate and John Chaplin. The reason for this paper is that um, historically, geologists have understood or predicted performance across a play based on tools such as play fairway mapping or common risk segment analysis where uh, assumptions are made about what the right thresholds are for production drivers, things like porosity is a green if it's greater than 6% and it's a yellow if it's between 3 and 6%, it's a red if it's below that. Um, and also volumetric estimation, coming up with oil in place or gas in place metrics and then applying some kind of recovery factor. Um, potentially this can have a Monte Carlo simulation involved to come up with those volumetrics. Uh, these, these tools um, have in common that they are forward modeling in that some assumptions are made about how different geologic factors uh, stack up to form productivity. And um, so, so that's what they have in common. But machine learning, which is becoming, of course, a big deal within our industry these days, uses statistical trends to understand how geologic properties impact the well performance. So it's, it's a data-driven rather than assumption-driven approach. Um, that has some problems, chiefly. It's, it's hard to understand what's going on and how the model is coming up with its results. However, new tools like Shapley values provide explanation data sets that show you how much each training variable, including including subsurface, impacts the model predictions. Um, these are these are pretty powerful tools, very uh, very promising. However, they can be you know difficult to put into context, difficult to understand. Um, and in in this paper today, what we're we're showing you are um, cross sections, which are a powerful tool to visualize these production drivers um, and give context and help communicate basically how the model is coming up with its reasoning for how the subsurface uh, parameters are impacting the performance. So we took as our study area the Bakken Three Forks play in the Williston Basin of North Dakota. Um, has a few things that make it advantageous. It's, it's uh, well drilled, there's, so there's lots of data points. There, uh, the, the public data is, is high quality there. Um, and there's also several different subplays. So those are reasons that attracted it to us. Um, in terms of input variables, we provided to our model completions. We had propane and fluid volumes as well as stage counts. Those were all normalized on a length basis. Um, we calculated spacing based on directional surveys. That's distances to various neighbors and overall neighbor count. We have some timing variables like parent count, time, um, and distance. And then we have geologic variables, which were interpreted subsurface grids. Here, what we used, we had uh, formation tags, Bakken and Three Forks wells, effective porosity, TOC, structural depth, clay volume, water saturation, net thickness, and uh, stock tank oil uh, in place. We did not include operator, uh, latitude, longitude, county, or area, or post drill operations. The reason for this is that we wanted to maximize the signal that the model was seeing from, from the subsurface and from the operator control parameters. Um, you know, if it, if it just learns that McKenzie County is a good area, that, that isn't really getting us where we want to go in terms of understanding the geological performance drivers. For model training, we, we used a decision tree based modeling approach, extremely random trees. These are similar to random forests. They create an ensemble model of decision trees that builds a, a robust model that avoids overfitting. Um, it can handle both numerical and categorical variables, categorical in our instance, uh, formation being a key one of those. Um, we, we split the input data into training and test sets on a pad basis, 80-20 to evaluate the performance. And then we, we target, or the model predicts, a 36-point vector of monthly cumulative production going from 30 to 1080 days. So essentially, we're, we're predicting the first three years production curves. Um, in contrast to a single target uh, model like uh, you know, one-year QM or, or EURs. Uh, the, the key additional item here that we're going to spend a little bit more time on are SHAP values, which are, are named after Lloyd Shapley to explain the model predictions. So Lloyd Shapley, he was a mathematician. He was trying to answer the question, if a bunch of people work on a group project together, how much credit should each one get? Um, so he won a, later a, an economics Nobel Prize for this, joking that he considered himself a, a mathematician and he never took a course in economics. 
Um, but the, the, that idea of explaining how much credit each individual should get was adapted to machine learning models to show essentially how much credit each training feature or training variable should get for the model prediction. So this is, uh, this, this, the output here, the explanation is, is known as a SHAP value, Shapley additive prediction. So for us, um, that'll be in units of barrels, and it'll represent how much the feature impacted the prediction in a positive or a negative way compared to the average training well. So these are, are you know, pushing it or forcing it away uh, from, from that average well uh, in the play. So in order to generate uh, regularized uh, cross sections, we, we produced um, a series of hypothetical pads along cross sections laid out across the play. So you see in the bottom right here, we have a map of uh, the Baca Three Forks play in Western North Dakota. Um, and then that, that kind of solid blue line there, that's a, an array of pads that we laid out. And then that little box that you see, we're, we're zooming in over here on the left, and you see those pads that we've laid out. Each of those pads is kind of a basic 3-3, uh, uh, 500 foot uh, map view spacing, 1,000 foot interwell spacing end zone. Um, and we forecasted um, at 1,000 pounds per foot prop and 101 PPG, 220 foot stages for 10,000 foot laterals. You know, that, that's, that's not super salient today, but um, just, just for context. These were, uh, so, so then we ran these through our machine learning model. We came up with forecasts, and then after the forecasts, we, you know, we run that surrogate model to generate the SHAP values. Um, for the visualization purposes of what we'll be looking at today, we'll be grouping these by pad, and we'll be using 365-day cumulative oil. So I, I know I told you we have a multi-target model, but uh, just, just to make the visualizations easier, we're looking at 365 days. So first, we'll, we'll start with the cross-section. This is going across the core of the play, and this is for Middlebach and Wells. And I'll spend a little time on here just explaining what exactly you're looking at, because we're, we're going to be looking at a, a bunch of these throughout the rest of the talk. So what we have um, on the x-axis here is essentially the pads are laid out from the west to the east along the C to C prime cross-section. Each set of, of bars you see there is uh, an individual pad location. Each bar represents the impact of a certain geologic variable on the model forecast. And so you see they're, they're colored by the different geologic features that were provided to the model. So we have uh, you know, effective porosity, TOC of, of the upper and lower Bakken shales, uh, clay volume, water saturation, net thickness, uh, oil in place, and structural depth. So if you were to you know, look at this you know, location right here, you know, you've got some orange bars, so you're getting some good, good positive contribution from structural depth. Um, some pinks, so you're getting some good from oil in place from the Bakken. Uh, blue, some, some positive from water saturation, and then kind of a little, a little small bit of, of, of the others. So if the bars are located on top of the, of the, uh, the zero line there, it, it's showing a, a positive impact. And if they're located below the zero line, it's a negative impact. The y-axis, this is the, the production impact or the SHAP value on the one-year QM oil barrels. So you know, we're going from kind of you know, minus 40 to, to plus 40 or so along this cross-section. So uh, now what I've done is I've kind of annotated a few different uh, observations you can make along this cross-section. To the west, we see some, some major negatives from low TOC and low oil in place. Um, that, that, that would be located kind of over here on this, this western margin of the play. Uh, then as we move to the east, uh, you kind of see there's some, some high drilling density there. Um, that's the deepest part of the basin. So you have favorable depths, nice pressures, low water saturations. And you see the, the two biggest bars there by far are the orange depths and the blue water saturations, both looking, looking good. Then as we move further to the east, we kind of cross across the, the Ness and Anticline there, and then the partial uh, field. So we're kind of clipping the south and southeastern edge of the partial Sanish uh, oil field. And uh, by contrast to the deep basin, these are, aren't really getting the advantage of those, those uh, nice depths and nice pressures, um, but they are getting a positive signal from uh, clay volumes and from TOCs. So I want to go into a little bit more detail on the TOC to kind of think about that, uh, since that was a, a key regional driver here. 
Uh, so on the on the left, what we have is this is along that same C to C prime cross section. Uh, the black line that we have is the TOC uh, weight percentage of the lower Bakken and shales. And then in green, we have the impact of that on the model forecast. So we see uh, that, that basically we get kind of a, a big impact as we get up to around 9 or 10 percent of TOC values for the lower Bakken shale. And, and reminder, lower Bakken shale here being a, a key source rock for the middle Bakken dolomite, um, you know, which, which lies directly above it, uh, the middle Bakken being the primary target. Um, we do see a, a one, you know, kind of interesting little bump here where we kind of see this this maximum at 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 12 percent uh, TOC or so, and then if we if we look on a cross plot version, so this would be all the training wells. So these are the wells already drilled, so we're no longer in cross section mode over here for this chart. Um, but we have that lower block and TOC and uh, percentage over there on the x-axis and the y-axis. We have impact on on production, and we see actually in Dunn, McKenzie, and Mount Trail counties, we see kind of a, a spike at 12 percent. I'm interpreting that as as the model is kind of using that 12% to identify that that Fort Berthold uh, sweet spot. So, you know, of course, it's it's not the fact that the TOC is 12% there. There's there's probably something else going on about the the richness of the generation there that's contributing to that. Um, in part part I say that because we we don't see that similar bump there in Williams in Williams County well. So maybe an avenue for, for future uh, investigation there. But this gives you kind of a general general view of what, what the model's learning about the impact of the TOC on a regional basis as we go along that cross-section. So returning to the cross-section, you know, if you remember, we had those uh, low clay volumes being a major driver in the Nesson and, and the partial fields. Um, and so now we'll, we'll kind of do that same thing that we just did with the TOC, but with clay volumes. So in orange here, we have clay volumes uh, percentage. Um, so we're going from 14 up to 18%. So for context, this is all relatively low compared to most unconventional plays. Um, we're kind of cruising along there at 17% or so. And then as that, that clay volume drops, especially as it goes below, you know, that 15 to 16% range there, we see a big spike in the green and the shaft values. So my guess is that there's not some sort of magical geomechanical difference uh, as you go you know, below 16%. It is possible there is some importance of this to the frackability. Generally speaking, clay volume is held as a, um, as a as very important for the geomechanics and the frackability of the well. Um, my guess is that this is a little, little too much impact um, to, to merely be geomechanics. So uh, what else might the model be using this to kind of learn, uh, quote unquote? Well, on the right, I have a map of clay volumes, and these are extracted out at, at Middle Bakken locations uh, around the play. Uh, yellows and, and oranges are higher clay volumes, blues are, are lower clay volumes. And we actually see that in, in the Ness and in that central part of the play, and then in, in uh, the, the partial Sanish fields there in Montreal County, we see some local minima in, in the clay volumes. Um, why that's the case, I mean, it could be that these were paleo highs, um, or, or rather, the Nesson was a paleo high. There could have been something else depositionally going on at Montreal County that, that made it have those low, lower clay volumes. But um, my hypothesis is that this, this may actually result in uh, kind of, or may actually be showing signal of these being uh, kind of current migration foci. So this, you know, we have a Bakken's a migrated play. Uh, these are, uh, Overpressure due to migration from other other parts of the play, not not too far away, but kind of short distance migration. So it might be that essentially the the clay volumes are indicating places where oil has migrated today. That that's pretty arm wavy, but it, that may be what's going on. Um, but you know maybe if we put an overpressure map, we could investigate that a little bit better. Okay, so now I'll bring up a, a cross section. Uh, for three forest wells, and this is going to be uh, southwest and northeast oriented again across the core of the play. Uh, color bars are the same as what you've seen, uh, but of course, structurally, it looks a little bit different in terms of how these production drivers are, are changing along the play. Uh, something big that jumps out at you here is that the water saturations in blue, those are, are by far the, the biggest driver that we see the variance as we go kind of from those unproductive margins and to get into the uh, get into the kind of core part of the play there. We also see an interesting kind of little local minimum there 
uh, along the flank of the nest. And this is something that's, that's seen in the literature and in the well results um, that possibly because, you know, like we were just discussing of, of uh, migration up dip from, from the flanks into the nest, and you, you see uh, some, some, some kind of local low in, in production there. But let's, uh, let's spend a little bit more time on the water saturation. Uh, so we have same styles chart here, water saturation in blue as we go across that cross section. And then in green, we have the uh, impact of that water saturation. Uh, we, we've added in here, so we have the, uh, the map of the water saturation. So we have in, in blue, those are the higher, higher water saturations along the margin. Uh, white would be 50%. You can kind of draw a contour line around there. And in the green, you're getting even lower than that. If we map the SHAP impact uh, or the SHAP values of that, we see a, a very clear uh, demarcation around that 50% line, which is the same thing that we see along the cross section. Uh, one reason that I find this interesting is that if you were compelled to use a stoplight system here, that might not actually kind of be appropriate for for this this particular factor. You know, this this actually might might need to be just kind of a Risk segment one looks good. Risk segment two looks bad. But uh, regardless, this is a you know great example of of model uh, kind of learning things and, and geospatially a great way to to view it in that map form there. All right, so now we're gonna zoom out even further and rather than looking at one cross section, we'll look at a, a set of cross sections. Um, these are middle Bakken, and we're gonna be going um, across the play from from the north to the south. We see up in the north these orange bars. Uh, it's it's very shallow up there. Uh, not a great place to to produce oil. Um, so that's obviously dominating uh, the the kind of the the production driver up there is is do dominant negative from the from the structural depths. As we kind of get down to the core part of the play, we see uh, now there's a nice water saturations, low quality volumes, good TOCs, good oil in places. Almost everything is working right there. That's why why we see it so high. Um, and then in the uh, the western and the southwestern part of of the play, we see those negatives there from from the TOC values um, and, and also from from porosities. So pretty interesting to see that that variation as you go through the play. For the three forks, and these these were focused on, on the play core here, just to kind of give you a slightly different view of kind of more granularly uh, how these things can can change. Um, we see that no matter no matter where we are along the cross section, those that water saturation is extremely important. Um, clay volumes, especially as we get down to that southwest, start to become more and more important. And then the eastern part of the play that's that's challenged on water saturations and structural depths, kind of no matter where we are. So uh, good, good, good story there for the three forks as well. So in conclusion, these SHAP values provide a powerful tool to estimate how geologic variables impact well performance. We visualize them here primarily in cross sections, although we did also show you the map of the, the three forks water saturation SHAP. Those are great ways to visualize SHAP values, uh, give you regional context, spark hypotheses, um, one thing that we were able to see from that is that different sweet spots have different sets of production drivers. Like Deep Basin has a different set than uh, you know the, the partial Sanish field. Three Forks uh, sweet spots have different sets of production drivers than do the Middle Bakken. And so if you're simply doing risk segment mapping or, or generating stoic maps, you, you, you might miss this uh, level of granularity. For the Middle Bakken, on the whole, we see clay volume uh, being a, a very impactful feature, although with the caveats that that, that may be kind of, the model may be using that as, as actually a uh, backdoor signal into overpressure, so that, that may be something for us to bring in uh, on a, a future modeling provided, provided we have the data set. Um, whereas for the three forks, we see the water saturation variance is, is definitely the, the most important driver with the, around a 50% threshold being uh, the, the critical one there at the highest rate of change. So th this talk, you know, we didn't do this to change your view of what drives performance in the Bakken of the Three Forks. This was really to show you how these new machine learning driven data sets can be visualized, how they can be used. Um, and so if you have a different set of data sets, it can be based on modeling data sets, geochemical, seismic conversion interpretive products, even kind of raw, raw products, you know, like just gridded gamma ray. 
uh, the model doesn't really care what input data you give to it. So it, it can be a really powerful tool. It can be used for a wide range of data sets, and we kind of hope to spark some you know, new, new ways of, of looking and thinking about unconventional productivity. Um, and finally, we'd like to thank Wood McKenzie for providing us the data used in this study. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate your time today.